bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make a boast in the Lord, and the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together, for the Lord is good. Ah, he is so good. His mercies are everlasting, and his truth endures to all generation. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are those that trusted in him. What an awesome and a gracious and mighty God we serve this morning. I thank God for such a great and awesome day today. The praise, the worship, the prayer, everything that's already taken place. The atmosphere is charged. The presence of God is here. The saints of God is ready. Now let's get right into the word of God. Would you journey with me, if you may, this morning into the Old Testament book of 1 Kings. 1 uh, Kings at the 19th chapter of 1 uh, Kings. I want to jump right into the word as we are charged and ready for God to speak to us this morning. Amen and amen and amen. Chapter 19 of First Kings. I'm going to begin reading at the first verse. And the Bible says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw, and when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. I want to really hang out in that fort verse this morning because... Uh, I think it carries a lot of impact and it carries a, a, a life lesson from which we can all glean from this morning. Again, and it says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. I want to ask you to keep your Bibles, your smartphones, uh, 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 devices open as we're going to go in and out um, of this uh, chapter, if you may. I want to cover a little more ground in it and make some references throughout uh, uh, maybe the, the, the preceding two chapters or so uh, and into chapter 19. So just hold your... Just hold your um, your reference is open so we can take a look in and out of it. With the time that's ours to share this morning, I want to talk, teach, and preach from thinking the thought this morning, enough already. Enough already. You know, uh, uh, you've probably heard the saying before that quitters never win. And winners never quit. Needless to say, quitting always has a negative connotation. And arguably, it is, it, it, it is ever, is it ever the right thing to do? Or is it even the healthy thing to do, which is quitting? And also, I want you to think this, 
Is quitting always a bad thing? Ah. Uh, can the words I quit or I'm done or enough already be complicated yet exciting? <laughs> can the one verbalizing I quit or enough already actually feel excited saying that while devastating the person to whom they're saying it ah. or even or even or even creating envy to those who would later find out why you said it likewise likewise quitting can be an impulsive action it can be a forced decision and uh, maybe you know few people ever quit without having a really good reason and when they do quit not too many of them return to that which they quit from i just want you to play back in your mind incidences or something where you may have quit on something and, and begin to understand why did you do it was it inevitable was it a good thing or was it a not good thing quitting carries that double-edged type sword and in case you didn't get it yet, I want to highlight the times in your life um, when you have landed in a place or a season and you just can't seem to break loose from the pressures and the stresses of life. Um, can't seem to find separation um, from your problems or distance yourself from some old habits. Uh, and after a while, as the pressure keeps building up on you and as the things around you keep circling you and keeps pressing on you all you got left in you is to say i'm done enough already this is the case of elijah this morning he simply had enough his spirit is worn out he is tired he feels in his tiredness, he feels distant from God. And he's carrying around in his mind the threat of Jezebel, who has threatened to kill him. And now he is mismanaging the pressures of survival. So he literally said in his prayer, It is enough. Now, Lord. Take my life. Oh, them some, them some powerful words right there. Them some words that shake you to the very core. And this morning I came to talk to somebody, somebody somewhere this morning who's been just going through and just going through. We are midway into the ninth month of the year. And maybe all down through the past nine months, eight months or so, stuff has just been pressuring you and squeezing you. And the floods of life has just been overwhelming you. And you just can't seem to catch a break. It's a, a disappointment after a disappointment. It's a failure after a failure. It's a no-go after a no-go. And everything just seems to be pressuring you. And like Elijah, you just can't take it anymore. And you feel like you're all alone. And, and like Elijah, he felt hungry and he felt tired and he felt that he had failed God and so he had made up a, he made up in his mind uh, I'm just gonna walk away from this because I've done with this I'm done with this I'm not gonna do it no more enough already have you ever been there beloved child of God have you ever landed in that place 
Has any time in this tw in, in this 20 and 24 brought you to a place where you felt like that was the only last two words that you wanted to speak out loud? Enough already. I wonder if I just described anyone this morning, someone who have had, who have had enough of it, who said, "I'm, I, I'm done with this. I'm, I, I, I'm in a, I, I'm in a, I'm done with it." Moment right now. Is there anybody who ever felt just tired of being a? Tacked, tired of struggling, tired of being blindsided, tired of always having to defend yourself, just tired of everything around you, people always crying you down, family always telling you, look at you, 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 you ain't going to amount to anything. Eh? Have you ever gotten to that point uh, where somebody is always bringing up something? Look at you, you had a child in your teenage years uh, and your whole life, look at you, you didn't do nothing with your life, you're just living a mediocre life, nothing is happening. Have you ever just been been tired of people just ragging on you and just pushing on you and just pointing out all the failures of your life, never giving you any kind of credit, never lifting you up, never building you up, but always pushing you down and just trying to, like you ain't feeling bad enough by yourself and people just making you feel worse. Have you ever been blindsided by people every time you turn around? My God, uh, you're looking to catch some breathing space and every time you turn around, people seem to be choking off the very breath of life in you are you ever tired of having to defend yourself from the mistakes of your past uh, that people always keep on reminding you had you not done that had you did that had you not done such had you not hook up with this one had you not go there had you not made this decision and you know you already made it and you already got to live with the results of it and people keep bringing it up to you causing you to defend yourself all the time have you ever been tired of just being on the defensive and the only thing left to do was to walk away and detach yourself from everybody and everything because everybody and everything just keep on making you feel worse and making you feel bad. And after a while, you just want to be alone. Can I talk to the real cool folks today? You know, the cool folks, uh, the folks that just say anything. I don't care what's going on. You got folks today, them young, especially younger people. You got folks today. I don't care if the roof is falling. What's going on? It's all cool. It's all cool. I want to talk to cool folks today. I don't talk, talk to your worry warts. Uh, I want to talk to the cool folks who, who may have felt uh, such pressures and stresses in life uh, that you said to yourself, enough already. I can't deal with this anymore. I'm just sick and tired of all the mess in my life and I'm not going to do this no more. I refuse to put up with this anymore. Enough already. That's the folk who I feel like talking to today because beloved, let me tell you the truth is if you done did give up on some of this stuff, I want you to know you aren't alone. You aren't alone. There's some folk right up in the same row that you're sitting this morning. There's some folks sitting right now in your seat with you this morning. Matter of fact, there's some folk even in scripture this morning that I want to remind you of. When you read the book of Numbers a couple books earlier, the Bible talks about Moses. And the Bible tells us Moses got to feeling that way himself. Well, let me help you remember if you didn't. After the exodus out from slavery in Egypt, God brought the children of Israel to Mount Sinai and they entered into a covenant with God. And despite the Bible says their rebellion, in spite the pushback, in spite the complaining, the Bible says God graciously and God lovingly provided a way for them to live near his holy presence in the tabernacle. By the 10th chapter of the book of Numbers, the Bible said after they stayed at Mount Sinai for one year, 
The Bible says they began to head into the wilderness, uh, guided, guided by God's presence uh, onto the land that God had promised Abraham. And immediately by the 11th chapter, after they took journey into the wilderness and God is guiding them, by the 11th chapter, the Bible says uh, that the people began to complain about being hungry. They began to want to go back to Egypt. They want to go back into slavery. They want to go back to where God delivered them from. By the 12th chapter of Numbers, uh, the Bible tells us Moses' own brother and sister began to resist him and criticize him in the presence of all the people. Oh, I tell you, sometimes it's your own that would do you in. But throughout the wilderness, the Bible says the children of Israel were so rebellious and so stiff-necked that Moses was so tired and fed up with them uh, that he goes to God and he basically says to God, God, I'm done with these folk. Uh, enough already. If I've got to leave them another day, kill me now because they are impossible to deal with. Uh, oh, 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 here's somebody else that you may or may not know in scripture. His name goes by the name of Jonah. And the Bible says God commissioned Jonah to go down to Nineveh and preach the word of God to help deliver his people in Nineveh. The Bible says Jonah, when he got the assignment, decided, man, this thing ain't for me. I, 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 I'm not getting into this. I can't handle this stuff. And the Bible says Jonah goes down to Tarshish and he boards a ship and he tries to flee from God. Oh, I came out to tell somebody, be careful now. You can't run from God. The Bible says Jonah gets in the ship and the ship takes sail. And midway into the ocean, a great storm arises and Jonah had to admit to the crew on the boat he says listen guys this storm that y'all are facing right now is as a result of my disobedience because I was on a some uh, I was on commission and I was on assignment by God but I jump on this ship to get away from God so this storm is my fault the Bible says his crewmates took him and threw Threw him overboard uh, and they said you know what if this is if you're the problem then you gonna have to solve uh, the problem so they threw him overboard to calm this to calm the waters uh, but here's what God refused to let him die uh, the Bible says God sends a big old whale uh, and the whale swallowed up Jonah and for three days and three nights he's praying and repenting until the fish takes him to the shore and dumps on dry land and so Jonah gets another chance oh by the way by the way did I tell you did, oh, oh I didn't tell you this one I didn't tell you this one there's a guy called Jesus and the Bible says that he was going into the garden of Gethsemane one day because he recognized Calvary was coming he began to discern and to envision the beating that he would take. He began to feel the, 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 the ripping off of his skin from his body. He began to envision the thorns of crowns that were on his head and the blood that would be gushing down from his scalp. He began to feel the agony and the hours that he would spend on the cross. He began to feel the removal of God's presence and love from upon him. And understand, wait, 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 wait. Let me give you this piece up because if uh, this is going to be so important to you <laughs> understand Jesus wasn't wasn't beefing on the pain the physical pain that he was going to suffer that was not what was distressing him read the text carefully it was that the second member of the Trinity became detached from the Father and the Holy Spirit. In other words, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And the second member of the Trinity, the Son, became detached from the Father and the Holy Spirit. And when he realized that he was going to be detached from his Father, he cried out, 
Father, why have you forsaken me? Oh, my children of God, understand something this morning. Whenever you are detached from God, it is very difficult to live. It is very difficult to make it. Whenever a child of God is detached from the Father, whenever a child of God detaches themselves from the Holy Spirit, and you begin to walk in your own flesh and you begin to walk in your own mind you're going to come up with that statement sooner or later enough is enough I can't do it anymore but they that wait upon the Lord they that walk by faith and not by sight the Bible says God will show up at your point of need God will Make a way out of nowhere. God will uh, come and cover you with his arms. And God will uh, lead you to that place of safety. Bible says at Gethsemane. Jesus called Peter and the sons of Zebedee. And hear the words he spoke to them. Recorded in Matthew the 26th chapter around about the 38th verse. He says my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. I just beloved told you about three main characters in scripture. Jesus, Moses, and Jonah. And as you read your Bible, you'll find out there's a lot more than them. Who got to the point of saying, death is okay now. And I'm here to tell somebody, I'm not telling you to feel for death. I'm telling you that when you hold on to God, when you stay attached to the Father and the Holy Spirit, His children, you and I, going to make it. It's as if Jesus was saying, Lord, don't make me have to do this. Have you ever, has any one of you ever just wanted to tell God, I'm not going to do this anymore. I've had enough already. Well, if you've been, if you've been done that, think about the prophet Elijah this morning. Bible says he's one of the greatest prophets in all of Israel. And he rightfully deserves that staple because of his faithfulness to God in the face of an evil king called Ahab. And what the Bible tells us is that Ahab did more to provoke the Lord's anger than all the previous kings of Israel put together. And coupled with that, he was married to one as equally evil as he was who went by the name of Jezebel. And she was a devout worshiper of Baal. Together, together, these two crazy lunatics incited God to anger. Because they encouraged Israel to worship a false god. They tore down the altars of the God of the Israelites. And Jezebel began to kill off the prophets of God. When you read your Bible, and I hope you read your Bible, you can flip back to the 18th chapter of the book of 1 Kings and you will find out where God told Elijah to go present yourself to Ahab and tell him I'll send rain on the earth. But immediately when Elijah approached Ahab, Ahab begins to blame Elijah for all the problems uh, that took place in Israel. Faithful to God's voice, uh, Elijah challenges Ahab. He says, gather your prophets of Baal and Asherah. He said, tell them, you and all of them, come meet me at Mount Carmel. 
and it is there standing by himself that day a, 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 a Elijah faces off against the 450 prophets of Baal and here's what went down Elijah proposes a showdown with them he says I'm gonna have a showdown today between my God and your God Baal he says let's settle this up here right now let's settle this right here right now who the real God is. Y'all say it's Baal. I say it's the God of Israel. He says, I'm the only prophet of the Lord left. He says, but y'all got 450 prophets of Baal. So here's what we're going to do. Y'all pick two bulls. Pick one for yourself. And let me have the other one. And he says, here's how we're going to do this showdown. He says, we're going to cut it up into pieces. Lay it on some wood around an altar. But don't light no fire under it now. Here's what we'll do. I'll do the same thing. Then you call on the name of your God. And I'll call on the name of my God. And the God who answers by fire. He is the real God. Bible says all the people agreed to that. And watch this now. So confident is Elijah that he says, I'm going to let you all go first. I suggest to you, I suggest to you, Elijah's faith is at its peak right here. Because two, verse, two chapters before, Elijah is just coming off of one of the most faith-strengthening exercises he has ever had. His day in the training camp of faith, he experienced depending on God at a brook chariot, a brook which dried up, a brook where he had no food and no water and God supplied. He just came off the training ground at the widow's house at Zarephath, where he had no food, she had no food, but God sustained them. Oh, that's a lesson right there for somebody this morning that every child of God ought to understand every confrontation that you face uh, and every issue and every challenge you go through in life. Uh, you got to lean on God uh, and call on your faith uh, and stand strong in God uh, and watch God bring you out. Uh, I'm talking to people of faith this morning because you didn't get here today without having some kind of faith. Uh, and it's that same faith faith you had for the problem that you had is the same faith that you need for the problems that you're gonna have. Can I say it to you again? The same faith that you had that brought you out of the problem that you had is the same faith that you need to have to bring you off of the problems that you're gonna have. The Bible says the prophets began to call on Baal. My God, the Bible says your morning Till noonday, they began to call on Baal. In the 18th chapter, it's in there. They said, oh, Baal, hear us this morning. But there was no answer. They began to leap and they began to jump around the altars. They began to weep and they began to wail. And they began to shout and they began to dance. But nothing happened. No Baal showed up. They began to cry out even louder. The Bible says, as was their custom, they began to cut themselves until the blood gushed out from them. And they began to prophesy in Baal's name. But Nothing happened. Baal was silent. Bible says about noontime, Elijah begins to mock them. Began to say to them, cry out some louder. Cry out some louder for you. Because somehow or the other, your Baal must be meditating. Make some more noise. Maybe he's a bit busy right now. Maybe he went out to lunch. Maybe your Baal is at happy hour right now. Maybe he left town and he's somewhere else hanging out. Maybe, maybe, maybe he fell asleep and the clock didn't alarm. Why don't you make some more noise? Because uh, he can't hear you. He can, he's not awake right. You know Elijah messed up, right? He makes fun of their God because Baal 
never showed up. So, so, it's Elijah's turn now. I imagine Elijah says to them, all right, all y'all sit down. Sit down over there. Everybody, sit down. Let me show y'all a real God. He calls on his servants and he says to them, get four barrels or 12 buckets of water. And I want y'all to pour it over the wood that is undergirding the bulls that we cut up. He says, pour it over a second time. Get more water. Pour it over the wood a second time. And they poured it over. He says, you know what? Do it a third time. And he poured, they poured more water over the wood. He makes, he makes the challenge even more difficult. And you know why he did that? Because that's how powerful his fate had become. That's how much faith Elijah had in his God. That's how much determination and that's how much gumption he had in his God. He placed God in a more difficult position than he had challenged the God of Baal to do. He told the Baal God, he told them, just let Baal fire up the kit. Let him just fire up the pit and let it cook. He said, no, 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 no. My God ain't going like that. Let me show you all. Soak that wood three times. <laughs> oh my God. He puts God in a position of such might that even the wet soaking wood is going to be set on fire. Bible says, Elijah begins to call on God. He says, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, I know what you can do. But these clowns up in here, they need to see that you ain't playing with them no more. They need to see what a real God is all about. So would you just fire up this altar this morning? Pretty please. The Bible says, don't miss this, don't miss this. Let me give it to you again. The Bible says, he prays, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that God, that thou art God of Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things according to thy word. Oh, can I tell you that prayer one more time? Because it's important, that prayer. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. He says, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art the God of Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, you are God. That's my children, recognition. He recognizes God. He says, I am your servant. He puts himself in submission. Puts himself in submission. And then he says, and I've done all the things at your word. Now he places expectation. Oh, I wish you're hearing this. He, 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 he deals with recognition. He puts himself in submission. And then he waits on expectation. Notice the importance in how Elijah lays out the prayer. He recognizes who God is. He surrenders to the authority of God and he knows what God can do. Ah, oh, help me, Holy Ghost. And here's the centerpiece. He says, and I've done all of this at your word. That's going to be important right there. In other words, if you just miss that, then you just miss the whole understanding of this event. Everything Elijah did 
from the moment he left on God's commission to tell Ahab what God said, the moment he left running from, Be uh, from Jezebel, all that time Elijah was doing what was in line with God's word. What's it? Elijah wasn't just barking out threats at Mount Carmel. Elijah wasn't boasting and bluffing the prophets of Baal. Elijah wasn't acting on an hypothesis or some arrogance. God led Elijah to the showdown at Mount Carmel. God was with him all along, but he just didn't know it because he became so consumed by the surrounding and what was familiar and what was ordinary. And that's the same problem that believers in the 21st century body of Jesus Christ have today because what you see is what consumes you. What you're surrounded with is what consumes you. The person who is messing with you on the job is who's concern, consuming you. The balance of the amount of money in your bank account is what's consuming you. And God said, I want you to understand all what you're going through. I'm with you all along. God was with Elijah all the time at Mount Carmel when he called down on God to set the pit on fire. God God was with him when he ran off into the wilderness in Bathsheba, when he ran off into the caves, when he ran off and sat under the broom tree. God was with him all along. But he was so consumed with what he was seeing. He was so consumed with what he was hearing. And isn't that just like we are today? Just when things don't seem right in our life, it begins to eat upon us. It begins to consume us. It begins to make us feel like there is no other answers. When the doctor gives the report, we believe that's the only way out. Because we lack the fate of an Elijah. Elijah wasn't trying to chastise the nation. It wasn't some twisted scheme that he had to promote a firefight between Jehovah and Baal. He wasn't trying to do his best Don King promotion and promote a fight. He was just trying to let people know who the God of Israel is. He wasn't trying to make folks be fearful of him. He wasn't quoting scriptures and threatening folks in the church. He was just trying to let folks know that your situation is between you and God. And I'm only here to just give you the direction and lead you to the scriptures and teach you according to the word of God what does say the Lord. Because sometimes I realize that you get consumed and you don't even understand what you're dealing with. So God gave some teachers and God gave some some preachers and God gave some evangelists and God gave some prophets to help you along the way we ain't come up in here to make you feel bad we came up in here to make you feel the word we didn't come up in here to give you empty promises I don't come up in here to fill your bank account I didn't come up in here to heal your body I come up in here to let you know there is a God who by his stripes uh, you can be healed. I came to let you know that there is a God uh, who can supply all of your needs uh, according to his riches and glory. I came to let you know that there's a God uh, that if you walk up rightly before him, no good thing will he withhold from you. The prayer, the prayer that Elijah laid out was to let us know, to let believers today understand the principle in prayer. Even those, even those, even those who are called and who are the called of God. 
that we ought to teach and preach the word of God and to approach the throne of grace with the one simple declaration Lord all these things I'm doing today all these messages that I'm preaching throughout my life I'm doing it at your word I'm not preaching a message but something I'm trying to get you to do that is what I want you to do I'm preaching a message that the word of God wants you to do Ooh, I feel it this morning I'm preaching a message that is supported by the scripture I'm preaching a message that God wants you to abide in I'm preaching the word that God wants you to abide in so that that word could abide in you. I'm preaching the word that will bring you to God. I'm preaching because I want you to know that the word of God shall not return void unto him. I'm preaching a word that, what, that I want you to know that when I pray on that word that I preach, that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. Watch what happens. Watch what happens. At Elijah's confident and obedient prayer, the Bible says, fire came down from heaven. And that wood, soaked three times in water, was set ablaze. That water-soaked wood caught on fire. And the power of God was on full display for all to see. And the Bible says, and then Elijah gives the order to have all the 450 prophets of Baal to be slain. I wonder if there's anybody in here today who gets it. That when you pray with recognition, in submission, and in expectation, God will show up so that all would know who he is and what he can do in your life. The Bible says, Ahab tells Jezebel what had happened. He says, Jezebel, a crazy Elijah, he killed all your prophets, girl. And Jezebel says, you know what? I'm making a vow. I'm going to kill Elijah within 24 hours. Because he exposed the lies of Baal worship. And he proved the glory of Yahweh. When, when, when Elijah gets Jezebel's message, Bible says he runs, he runs and he hides. He finds himself under a broom tree in the desert. And his prayer takes on a language of desperation, just like some of us today. He begins to pray and he says, you know what? I'm done with this. Enough already. No, 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 no. I want to talk to somebody today who's wrestling with some issues in your life. Somebody, somebody who gave up on everything, who gave up on everything to take care of your children. Somebody who feels like you're at a crossroad in a relationship. Huh? And in your heart, you're saying, God, I'm done with this. I can't do this no more, God. The classes are too difficult. I tried. I tried. I went to one, I went to one semester and I just can't take it. The boss is always riding me on this job. I, I'm just going to leave the job. I can't deal with it. The ministry is becoming too demanding. Enough already. I can't, I can't, I can't handle it no more, God. What your family, Elijah, points us to some valuable insights in scripture. Something we ought to hang out with today. That God is always with you. If you are a child of God, if you are a believer, hear me today if you ain't hear nothing else. If you are a believer, God is always with you. Even when you reach breaking point. Notice, notice, now notice this, notice this. Watch this. Jezebel, read it in the text, sends a messenger to tell Elijah she's going to kill him. 
Now, who does that? Who does that? Based on this, based on this, the text says she is so mad at Elijah. Here's what she actually said. She says, let the gods do with me and more also. If I don't kill you, Elijah, by tomorrow about this time. Okay, you missed it. She prays a prayer. God to her gods. That they do more than just kill her. If by tomorrow this time, she don't kill Elijah. But she sent a messenger to tell him she's coming to kill him. You get that, right? You're still holding on to that? So the question is, why would she give him warning that she's coming to kill him? Knowing, watch this now, knowing that she will die if she fails. It just don't add up. Because if you're telling him you're coming and he goes on the run, and 24 hours later, you ain't catch him and kill him. Then you ask your gods to kill you. So why are you going to ask your gods to kill you and expose to him you're coming to kill him? Otherwise, God's going to kill you. It just, are you catching this? Because it don't add up. Here's another thing. Here's another thing. Elijah runs into the desert to hide. That's in verse 2 of chapter 19. And he prays to God that he might die. He says, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life. That don't sound right, does it? Doesn't it sound confusing to you as well? Because it sure does to me. Because here's what I'm dealing with. Here's what your smart, educated pastor is handling and having a difficult time in. If he really wants to die. Why is he even running? Why not just confront Jezebel and take your chances and battle it out? You're, you're asking God to, 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 to let you die, but you're running from Jezebel who said, I'm going to kill you. After all, isn't that what he just did? Isn't that how he just dealt with some things? If you go back into 18, chapter 18 and verse 11, the Bible says, Elijah rolled up on Obadiah, who was, who was, who was under the, the, the command of Ahab. And the Bible says he tells, he rolls up on Obadiah and he tells Obadiah, go tell your master, Elijah is here. He says, he says, he says, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, Ahab is going to see me today. When he told Obadiah, go tell Ahab I'm here. Obadiah said, but man, you, are you kidding? I can't say that. You know the man's going to kill me. You know they've been looking for you. How I'm going to go and tell him he's going to kill me if they don't find. Can you please spare me? Can you please? I'm good. Did you not hear what I did when, the, when, when Jezebel was killing out all the prophets? I, I, I secured a hundred of them and I hid them in the cave and I fed them bread and water and I took care of them. I'm a good guy. I'm one of the good guys still. Why are you going to put me in that situation where Ahab going to kill me, man? And, 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 and Elijah responds. As the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, I'm going to see Ahab one way or the other today. He's ready to throw down with Ahab. Now, 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 in chapter 19, you got to understand. Understand the concept. Elijah is riding a wave of confidence. He just destroyed my God. 450 prophets of Behar. He just stood on the winning side of the battle of the gods. He just trusted God to rain down fire, demonstrating his strong faith. Added to that, he experienced the evidence of God having his back. And added to that, he just had the 450 prophets of Baal executed. So, so, so how does a threat from a lobbyist of Baal strike so much fear in his heart that he wants to die? 
Can you help pastor understand that? I'll go sit in Sunday school after and you explain me what is going on in this man's mind. Well, I'm going to explain you if you can. It seems more plausible that Jezebel never wanted to kill e Elijah. Jezebel had to save face in the presence of her people. And she wanted to discredit Elijah before his new converts, whom he was trying to turn and transform through the power of God. She wanted to make him look bad in the presence of his people because he was finding success when his God showed up and embarrassed her God. She found that he was gaining success. And so by making the threat, she is hoping to scare him enough that he goes into hiding. And that's exactly what he does. Because why send a messenger to tell him she's going to kill him? Why didn't she just send some assassins and some troops? And why didn't she just go and kill him? So I submit to you, here's what really happened. In the moment, ooh, this is so sweet. In the moment of Elijah's weakness, in the moment of fear, in the moment of tiredness in his body, in the moment of lifting the burdens and the pressures of life, in the moment of the emotional upheaval that he's feeling, he begins to magnify the threat that he receives and he begins to elevate the power of the person who sent the threat and he allows what he hears and he allows what he sees to begin to dominate and overcome the same faith which sustained him and brought him through major confrontations. Oh, I told you early on, some of you are sitting here today because you had some faith to get through some problems that was in your past. And you need to have some faith just like that and even more to get through the problems of your future. And and so he has given his adversary much more attention than she actually deserves. Get this. He has made Jezebel's threat even look bigger than how he destroyed the 400 prophets of Baal. He has made Jezebel's threat even bigger than how his God, the same God who just rained down fire and displayed divine power, he just elevated Jezebel to be greater than him. And you know why he did that? Is a problem why a lot of us do it. Because we're not thinking or seeing clearly. Truth is, Jezebel isn't the problem. Jezebel was never the problem. Can I tell you? Can I tell you? Elijah is Elijah's problem. Jezebel wasn't Elijah's problem. Elijah just experienced God in one in, in one of the most phenomenal ways ever. And at the voice, at the voice of a woman just threatening him. And I'm not I'm not dismissing women in any way. I'm not minimizing that. Don't get me wrong. Don't 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 send me them stupid emails. I told y'all. At the threat of this individual, he is afraid that he wants to die. How is that? How is that? Jezebel ain't the problem. He is the problem. He magnifies a threat into something bigger than God. And child of God, I've been around this, this, this Christian thing for uh, way too long. Not too long, but way long enough to feel confident saying this morning that far too often people that sit right there in the row with you or sit next to you, people that even sit in your seat, magnify their problems to the point that it seems like God isn't big enough to handle it. Far too often, folks make their bills bigger than God. Folk makes a sickness in their body too difficult for God to handle. Here's Elijah's problem. He says, I can't do this no more. The work is stressful. It's tiring. And it feels like I'm accomplishing nothing. And he blames his own unworthiness. The Mount Carmel experience 
experience was short-lived. You see, he didn't see the results of Mount Carmel maybe the way he wanted to see it. It wasn't that kind of service uh, where the church was packed out. God, uh, There was good worship and there was good word, but there was no transformation. Uh, Mount Carmel didn't result uh, in a national revival or major addition to the church. He didn't see that. Everybody walked away that day. Well, congratulations, Elijah. Your God won. Uh, but he didn't see what he wanted to see. And far too often, your prayer, you don't see the results of your prayer right in front of you. But God is working it out. Uh, oh, tell somebody God is working it out. Uh, because sometimes when you pray your prayer today, you may not see the answer until next month. Uh, sometimes when you pray and believe God for some things in your life, in your life of your children, you may not see the answer today. Or you may not see it when you go home. But you're going to see it manifesting in the present, in the future. Elijah's running. It's been a whole day, the Bible says, a whole day he's running. And clearly he's in a disturbed state of mind. He's hungry and he's tired. He's not only hungry and tired, he's angry and he's alone. Bible says he laid down and slept under a broom tree and is awakened by the touch of an angel who told him, arise and eat. Bible says he lays down under a broom tree and is awakened by the touch of an angel who told him arise and eat okay you don't understand what i just said so let me do it again the bible says he lay down and slept under a broom tree and is awakened by the touch of an angel who told him arise and eat he's running away from jezebel but he doesn't realize God is with him. Okay, okay, okay. You still, you, 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 you still not with me. So let me prove it to you. God, provi he, he, remember he's in the desert. He's in the wilderness. God provided a place for him to rest. God provided bread and water to sustain him. God provided an angel to guard him while he slept. So he didn't just get there on his own. The Lord was always with him. When he was running for a day, God was with him. When he got into the wilderness, deep into the wilderness, God led him to a broom tree where he got shelter and he could have sat down and slept. There was no beast in the field. There was nothing trying to kill him. No crocodiles, no snails, no snakes, no boa constrictors, nothing was trying to kill him God placed him in a place of safety and what's God God did God planted an angel in the broom tree area to watch over him while he slept and watch what God did God got the angel to give him some food and water because he's been going now all day long with nothing to eat and nothing to drink and the Bible says that while he lay there and sleep, God was watching over him all the way since he left Jezreel. And God knew, watch this, God knew what he would have needed to bring him out of the position and the mindset that he was in. Because if you remember what he prayed a little earlier, was God, it is enough. Now take my life. He prayed that before he fell asleep so his last words was I want to die I'm tired I'm sick enough already but God said no 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 I'm going to watch you and I'm going to keep you and I'm going to say who am I talking to this morning you are trying to give up you are trying to leave your situation you are trying to leave your assignment but God says no 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 
I got a broom tree for you to sleep under. I got some food and water for you to be sustained. I got an angel on assignment watching over you all day, all night, every day, all day long. Angels are guarding over you. They're going to work with you. They're on the bus with you. They're on the train with you. They're driving in a passenger seat with you. They're at your desk with you. They're in the bank with you. Wherever you are, the angels are watching over you. Somebody, hear this. Elijah wanted food and rest. God supplied it. Elijah didn't want to die any more than somebody today who's going through a rough patch. Yeah, you're going through a rough patch. You don't cry out enough is enough, but you ain't want to die. Elijah's situation suggests that when deep depression sets in, it is reflected in his prayer. And so he wanted to die was not a result of spiritual or emotional breakdown. It was because of his physical weakness. He's weak in his body. He's hungry. He's tired. He's angry. And he's feeling all alone. Watch the movement of the text. In verse 4, he's depressed and he wants to die. He falls asleep. In verse 5, the angel touches him, wakes him and tells him, arise and eat. All of a sudden, he was alone. Now he's got bread and water. So now in verse 6, his hunger is satisfied. And so, and so when you read verse 6, it says, And after he ate, he laid back down and slept. So now, his hunger is satisfied. He goes back to sleep. In verse 7, the angel comes back now and wakes him again. And tells him, arise and eat. So now he's slept twice. He has eaten twice. <laughs> Ooh -wee. Watch this. And he's not planning anything. He doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't know where he's going. He thinks he's still hiding. He thinks he's under that broom tree. And his, and his plan is to hide. But the angel tells him, you need to eat again. Because the journey you're about to take. Oh, I wish I could preach this thing. Because the journey you're about to take is far greater than you can handle. So God has supplied for you so that you could take the journey. I'm talking to somebody today. I'm talking to somebody today. Because you think your journey is over. You think you ain't going no more. You think you have reached your max. God ain't even done with you yet. God ain't even start to show you. The things that your eye cannot see in your ear. I wish I had a believer with me today. You, 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 you can't even understand what's going on yet. God ain't even start to show you what's going on in your life yet. You see, you see, you see, I hope you're seeing the process. He's juggling multiple issues to the point that wanting to give up and God is working on ordering his steps. He wants to give up, but God is working in the background of ordering your footsteps according to his plan, not your plan. But Elijah is not focused. He's too consumed by being hungry and tired and being alone and being angry. He is too consumed because by verse 8, we get the clarity. God is preparing and strengthening him for a journey of 40 days and 40 nights to the mountain of God at Mount Horeb. Where, 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 where? So when his physical needs were satisfied, the Bible says he began to think a little bit clearer. And so when he talks to God in verse 10 and in verse 14 he's not praying about dying anymore here's what his prayer goes like lord i'm 
angry because the children of Israel abandoned their faith in you and I alone am left. He's having a Moses' moment that in his deficiencies of hunger and tiredness, in the deficiency of his anger and being alone, he can't even think straight. He has lost the value of his faith. He has lost the sight of God and he is depressed. Okay, 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 okay. I'm going to drive up in your driveway right now because I want to ask the question to you. How many times have you been guilty of reacting incorrectly when you experience uh, deficiencies and flaws? Uh, whenever situations spiral out of control, how many times uh, has panic and fear and anxiety and moments of anger and frustration drive you under your broom tree where you pray enough is already? I know there's more than a handful of us in here who can testify to being in lack uh, and facing financial deficiencies uh, and struggling with some family issues. Uh, maybe yours is uh, a health condition. Maybe yours is that you lost a loved one uh, that was near and dear to you. Maybe, just maybe, just maybe you are sitting under your broom tree this morning because your business is failing, because your mortgage is upside down, or maybe your ministry demands uh, is just overwhelming you and you just had had about enough of it all uh, and you just can't bear it no more. Well, I've got the assignment this morning and I've got the mic this morning to tell you don't you dare make that decision based on a physical or an emotional perspective don't you allow your intellect to supersede God's wisdom and knowledge don't you go dark now now that God is preparing the light uh, to call you into his marvelous life don't you go and hide now that God is breaking down doors uh, and moving barriers uh, to let you and don't you go dark now that God is leading you into your Canaan don't you go and hide in the cave of your darkness and God's trying to bring you into his marvelous light because too many come too many in the community of believers have missed out due to their physical and emotional mismanagement and child of God I came back to declare to you God has a plan in place concerning every area of your life and even though it can't if it, it, it can only get lonely sometime under your broom tree even though it gets so absent uh, with nobody around you even though sometimes the journey can the, don't feel like it's going anywhere even though there, there, there there's no surprise uh, that fear and anxiety just loves to hang around where there's a lack of happiness and optimism even though all these things are real god is with you because the bible teaches us they that wait upon the Lord shall renew in strength. The Bible teaches us that your eye had not seen, your ear had not heard, neither have it entered into the heart of your man that things that God has prepared for us. The Bible teaches us that weeping may endure it for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. The Bible teaches us that we ought to trust in the Lord and lean not on our own understanding. Beli be be beloved, hear me this morning. Don't you dare give up now, but rather look onto the hills from whence cometh your help. Because I assure somebody this morning, God knows what you need when you need it. Here's an important part. Faith decline doesn't only come by way of adversarial attacks. In the experience of Elijah here, a person can also bring those feelings of depression and desperation upon themselves due to a lack of self-management. And the hard reality is, at times, you just really do need to get away. Can I talk to somebody? You see, 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 see they got too many deep Christian folk, y'all think? Y'all think y'all are God sometimes. Y'all just got to fix everything. But sometimes you need to get away. Sometimes you need to go on a vacation. No, you ain't got to go to Dubai all the time. If you could, by all means, go. Sometimes your Dubai just got to be down the beach. Go. Just go away for a while. You need to take some time for yourself. You need to take some take care of me time. And you need to get away sometimes. Sometimes you just need to separate yourself from all the, all the busyness and all the action and all the drama. And let God speak to you. Because since God dwells in us, 
and we are the temple of God. We must take care of God's temple. So you can't be tired, frustrated, weary, can't hold up, can't, can't, can't stay up for an hour because you're, you're falling asleep on yourself. You're so exhausted and not give God a chance to work in you. This may not go down well with everyone, but the truth is sometimes things that you're struggling with, some of the things that you're struggling with is not the problem. It's not the root cause of the problem. Sometimes the things that you're struggling with is how you're handling the problem. Sometimes it's how you are managing what you're dealing with because you're coming at it with no faith. You're coming at it and you ain't prayed about it. You're coming at it not with God in you. You're only using your human intellect and you're using the anger and depression to fuel you. All right, all right, all right, all right. Let's do this and, and done. Twice in the content of the text, at verse 14 and at verse 10, Elijah tells God, I alone am left. And his statement wasn't entirely accurate in terms of being alone. But it's how he felt he was speaking. Because in chapter 18, in, of, uh, 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 on verse 22, Back at Mount Carmel, Elijah also said, I'm alone, and I'm the only one of the prophets left. You see, beloved, frustration and discouraging situations would make most people and even believers like you and I feel more isolated sometimes than we really are. Elijah wasn't completely alone. All he had to do is ask God for some help. Because later down you'll read where God sent Elisha to be his understudy. And if you feel, you know, if you feel it and you really think about it, if he was the last one left, wouldn't that be motivation enough for him to remain alive? Wouldn't he want to be in God's witness program? Wouldn't he want to be in the protection program of God and say, well, God, I'm the last one, so hold on to me and keep me? Why would you want to die? Shouldn't he want to live as long as possible? Shouldn't he be wanting God to show him how to take out Jezebel like God did for him with the 450 prophets of Baal? Rather than let fear and anxiety, rather than let anger and frustration and loneliness get to him? Church family, let me leave you with this. You can't allow your circumstances and your situations to, detect, to, to dictate your outcome. Don't be so quick to give up on God or give up on your faith or give up on your dreams or give up on your callings. There will be and there must be moments when it feels like you're at your last nerve or like you're all alone and all you got left is an uh, uh, enough already answer. And when those feelings become real, and they will, you must speak to these issues directly. Your declaration should be directed at the problem and to the issue only. Therefore, when you pray enough already, it ought to go something like this. I declare and decree in the name of Jesus, I am done with being broke. I am not accepting this sickness in my body. I can't work this degrading job no more. Enough already of living paycheck to paycheck. Is there somebody today who's ready to declare, I can't do the press no more. I ain't dealing with stress no more. I refuse to live my life in sadness anymore. I'm not going to do anxiety and fear fear anymore not gonna be deprived anymore not gonna be in lack anymore not gonna be afraid anymore i'm not gonna be denied anymore i'm not gonna get angry anymore because i'm gonna stand on the word of god by reminding myself of psalms 46 and 1 which says god is my refuge and strength a very present help in my times of trouble I'm going to recall to mind Isaiah 41 and 10 which says do not 
fear for I am with you do not be dismayed for I am your God I will strengthen you and I will help you I'm gonna dial back into Philippians 4 and 19 and I'm gonna say my God will meet all of my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus and I'll always remember what Psalms from 34 and 10 says that even the young lions lack and suffer and they're hungry but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing so I'm done enough already enough already I'm gonna just trust God for every spiritual and natural Canaan blessing that is assigned to my life I'm not gonna get to the point where I'm enough of enjoying the presence of God I'm going to have that feeling towards everything that is not the joy of the Lord. I have had enough of all the frustrations and discouraging things in my life because God says that I shall lack no good thing. God bless you, beloved. May the Lord keep you his perfect will and wherever you find yourself whether it be under a broom tree whether it be under your covers whether it be the dark closet wherever you find yourself may you be always reminded that God is with you God is right there with you child of God let nothing and no one make you think or feel any other way god knows what you need and when you need it be strong in your faith and in the power of his might god bless you richly may the lord keep you in his perfect will until next time if god bless you with this message and you feel excited about it would you help me to help somebody else. Would you share the message for me. On your Facebook page. Would you share it to, some, to someone who you think. Who you just think. Might need a word of encouragement. And lifting up this morning. Would you share it to them. Would you do that for me. God bless you richly. I look forward to seeing you again. And with the love of Jesus. I love you. With all my love. God bless you. See you again.